Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 218. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. Between writing notes, filing insurance claims, and scheduling with clients, it can be hard to stay organized. That's why I recommend Therapy Notes. Their easy-to-use platform lets you manage your practice securely and efficiently. Visit therapynotes.com to get two free months of Therapy Notes today. Just use the promo code THERAPYCHAT when you sign up for a free trial at therapynotes.com. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today's conversation is definitely something different that I have not approached previously on Therapy Chat. I'm very excited and I hope you'll be curious too about this discussion. My guest today is Dr. Craig Heacock. Craig is an adolescent adult psychiatrist and addiction specialist in Colorado and he's the host and co-producer of the psychiatric podcast, Back from the Abyss. Craig is a co-therapist in the phase three trial of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. He has particular interest in the use of ketamine and other psychedelics to treat severe mood disorders and PTSD. Craig is a graduate of the University of New Mexico School of Medicine, and he did his psychiatry training at Brown University. We ended up talking for about three hours. And I um, am only sharing with you the part that we recorded for this podcast, which is quite a bit shorter than that. But it was a fascinating conversation that we had both, I think, what you're going to hear and just talking with Craig in general. He's a very, very interesting person and extremely enthusiastic and knowledgeable about his work. So I admit I have been somewhat skeptical about the things I've heard about psychedelic research for helping trauma survivors. But, you know, I'm always, I try to be open to whatever will help. And as long as there's no harm, you know, I'm in support. So I had a very, I was soaking up everything Craig was saying like a sponge. And I thought it was really interesting. I wonder what you will think. Let's just dive right into my conversation with Craig Heacock. Therapy Chat Podcast wouldn't exist without the support of its listeners. If you'd like to become a member, please go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. By making a $1 per month donation, you can help Therapy Chat keep going over the long haul. Thank you for your support. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today, I'm very excited to bring you what I know is going to be a fascinating discussion with someone who's doing something very unconventional as a therapist. My guest today is Dr. Craig Heacock. Craig, thanks so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Laura. Yeah, I'm so glad we were able to connect. I'm fascinated by what you're doing. You are a psychiatrist and a podcaster, host of Back from the Abyss, And you are doing some, you're part of some very interesting research into using psychedelics to help people heal from PTSD. Yeah, I am part of what's called a phase three study of looking at MDMA, which is the street drug ecstasy or molly, but this is pure pharmaceutical MDMA, using MDMA to catalyze psychotherapy for trauma. The study is called MDMA Assisted Psychotherapy for PTSD. And there are a number of sites around the U.S. Fort Collins is one of the study sites. So I am a co-therapist and physician in the study. I have a female co-therapist and we are working with people with severe, typically complex PTSD uh, using MDMA or placebo to do all day long kind of deep dives into trauma. And The study also includes what we call some preparation days and integration days. And 
yeah, this is a, it's a fascinating time to be alive in trauma work and, and psychedelics are coming back. Yeah, this is really, I mean, there's, you know, I think a little bit controversial in some circles, but the work sounds really important and interesting. And I, I definitely want to hear all about it. But before we even really dive in, let's just talk about, well, I'll just ask you to introduce yourself to our audience and just tell them like more about what you do in your life. In my life, yeah. In your work. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I'm in Fort Collins, Colorado. I'm in solo private practice. I'm an adolescent, adult, and addiction psychiatrist. And in my practice, I see a wide range of things. Lately, I've been doing a lot of IV and intramuscular ketamine treatment for severe depression and suicidality. And then, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm in the MDMA study, which is sponsored by an organization called MAPS. And then also, I just six months ago, I started a podcast called Back from the Abyss, which is a psychiatric storytelling podcast. It's people telling how they plunged uh, into the psychiatric abyss and, and their journey out. And that's been an incredibly meaningful process and really a way that it's helped me to sort of fill my emotional tank from the really intense work that you know we all do in mental health and in trauma. Yeah, podcasting is such a wonderful creative outlet and can provide so much connection that I think it's like you don't realize it when you take on becoming a podcaster, but it's it's a beautiful thing. It really is. Even just the editing, the the people's stories, I'm I'm in my house literally with my headphones on, tears streaming down my cheeks, but they're just tears of really of, of joy of hearing you know, people's stories and my wife will walk by shaking her head like, oh, there you go again. <laughs> what are you <laughs> long, doing, Craig? How long are you going to sit there and, on your laptop and just tears going down your cheeks as you listen to these stories? But it really has just given so much back and to help people tell their stories. Uh, it's been w- one of the most powerful things I've done. And it's it's fun because much like Laura, you therapy therapy chats your baby. You know this is my baby, and um, like being part of the MDMA research is just fascinating and meaningful. But you know I'm a I'm part of a big complicated multi site study, and it's just very different to be involved in a complicated research project versus having people come in, um, put on headphones and microphone, and have them open their heart to share their their deepest psychological psychiatric abyss and and what that was like. Yeah, there's, I'm sure your role is quite different in being a co-therapist in the study versus just talking with people, you know, just having an interpersonal connection with people that isn't, you know, you're not really in your psychiatrist role or your therapist role there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's so important that we have different roles because, boy, if you just only do one thing, especially you know, if you are just working with trauma, for example, oh, my gosh, I, I think you have to find ways to fill your cup and, and just sort of remind yourself that people heal and that there's good in the world and mm-hmm. uh, not every uncle is creepy. And, um, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes you can be safe. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you for sharing that. And um I want to kind of clarify something because as you and I were talking before, we we noted that you may be you're definitely among one of the first psychiatrists I've had on the podcast. And you seem like you are not the kind of psychiatrist who does like 15 med minute med checks. No, yeah, no, no, <laughs> no, I am. Um... Yeah, I went to a psychiatry program, Brown, that really celebrates therapy, and I went there very purposefully, and I love therapy. Um, it's Personally, it's been deeply helpful for me, and I love working with other therapists. For some of my patients, I am their therapist, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. And yeah, the whole med check thing, to me, is so profoundly depressing, distressing, and especially this latest thing that, that psychiatrists are starting to call themselves psychopharmacologists. Hmm. Which to me would be like a cardiologist saying, "Oh, I'm a, I'm a um, cardiac pharmacologist, you know, or a GI doc. I'm a gastrointestinal pharmacologist." I mean, it just to seed the whole idea of connecting interpersonally and through therapy, and I, I, 
that is just the most depressing trend in psychiatry right now. And luckily, there's still a lot of psychiatrists who are doing what I do, which is longer sessions and incorporating therapy into their work and, and celebrating therapy and not just thinking of, of it as an adjunct and that meds are the primary thing, because I actually think it's the opposite. I think therapy is primary and I think meds are adjunct. Personally, that's what I think too. Mm -hmm. So I would love to learn more from you about this, this idea of using psychedelics to help people who have PTSD. What is, what is this study trying to do? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe a little background. So MDMA, MDMA was before it was made illegal in 85 actually was used fairly extensively in the underground trauma therapy community for about the decade before 85. And, and apparently there's a couple books written about that era that are fascinating, but when the DEA decided to schedule it, make it schedule one and illegal in 85, a bunch of therapists went to DC to testify to say, look, please DEA don't make the schedule one, which would mean it'd be essentially banned from any research or, or medical inquiry and please schedule it some other two, three, four like benzos or opioids or at least so it could be controlled carefully, but it could potentially be used. And But in those days, 85, those are the just say no years and the Reagan years and it was made illegal uh, in 85. But uh, Rick Doblin, who started MAPS in 85, he started a now 34-year quest to do the background research and raise the money and get the, the, the studies going to show that, in fact, MDMA was a powerful trauma treatment catalyst. And so over the last eight, nine years, this has been happening. Phase one, so there's three phases of studies that have to happen for a med to be approved by the FDA. Phase one is a, is a safety inquiry, and that happened. MDMA was shown to be safe in the dosages and frequency, which is being used in the study. Phase two was done a few years ago. That was looking at efficacy in a small population of people. And then phase three, which we're in right now, which is the final step towards potential FDA approval in a few years. Phase three is looking at MDMA efficacy for trauma in a larger population, which right now MAPS is looking at probably enrolling a few hundred people-ish, two, three hundred, something like that. And which is actually a very small number of people. Most phase three drug trials have thousands of people because they need that many people to show statistical significance. The, the data from phase two were so powerful that MAPS is thinking that with a relatively small sample size that they're going to be able to show efficacy to the FDA. And in phase two, at 24-month follow-up, almost 70% of people remained in remission from PTSD. Uh, and 70%. Again, yeah, I think it was 69% was the actual number, just under 70, yeah, at, at wow. 24 month follow up. And this is after only three open label MDMA sessions. Me, open label means <clears throat> the therapist knew they were giving MDMA and the participants knew they were getting it. And, and of course, preparatory sessions, integration sessions. And so it's not just the three all day um, MDMA catalyzed sessions. But yeah, that phase two showed almost 70% of people in full remission of PTSD at two years, which is, asto- is an astounding number. Yeah. Because again, this is a very treatment-resistant population. So on the on the heels of that data, MAPS has, has thought that if things go as they're hoping, and we're all hoping that with a relatively small sample size of a few hundred people that we'll be able to show uh, very significant you know, efficacy compared with placebo and get it approved sometime in the next two, three, four years. So it sounds like from what you were telling me before we started recording, the placebo would be, they would still receive the same trauma treatment, but not mm-hmm. the, not the medication. Right. You know? Is that right? So, right. So in the, in the study the the model is, is a non-directive supportive model of therapy and so even people that are getting placebo are getting 50, 60 hours of therapy with a male-female team. So, so really, that it's, the study is comparing you know, the 50 to 60 hours of um, supportive non-directive trauma therapy with placebo versus with MDMA uh, on three separate treatment days. Now, p- people are showing some improvement, not surprisingly, 
in the placebo arm. And, you know, that's, I'm guessing that's because that's a lot of time just to build trust. And for a lot of people in the study, they, they may never have had a therapist or that they had a lot of trust with, or a prior therapist might have taken, might have taken years and years to develop that. But, and I'm, I'm also curious too, having a male female team, I think that catalyzes some really interesting things in the room. It, it kind of, it allows kind of good cop, bad cop. It allows people to consciously or unconsciously decide who they're going to connect with more or find safety with. Seems like it replicates the parent dynamic. It's, it it t- exactly does. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. That's very, that's that's very conscious. So I mean, one of the dilemmas is if MDMA is actually made legal and approved for trauma treatment, is what will be the therapist model? Because now in the phase three trial, it's a male and female therapist. I think Maps just approved female female therapy teams. Like I think that's coming soon. But but if it's made legal, will Will people be doing it with one therapist, which brings out a whole range of issues because a lot of people with complex trauma have, yeah, mother and or father trauma and sexual trauma. And I think it could be a very different dynamic and potentially more more difficult to manage with one person. So, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. For now, though, I think this is a really interesting model. And I have to say, it's it's been really interesting and challenging and meaningful to, to sit with it, my female co-therapist for all these hours and to work with someone who she has very different background than me very different training very different orientation and but it's cool like she the things she knows i don't know and the things i know she doesn't know so i feel like we're we're a cool sort of venn diagram coming together to try to help people and it's too bad we can't do that more often in therapy it's it's really cool to sit in the moment to moment world of therapy and have a co-therapist and just try to figure out how do you work together to help someone and um, and then processing with that co-therapist afterward. It's I mean, I haven't done anything like that since I did, since I ran therapy groups in residency. Yeah. Most of the time the the when you're co-leading a group would be the time that you could do that. Mm-hmm. Or maybe if you were in a hospital setting. But mm-hmm. Most hospital settings, from what I understand, don't really allow for the kind of, you know, treatment that we're talking about here. It's more kind of crisis oriented. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know. Maybe there are some that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I know there are some inpatient programs that might be different or residential programs. But so will you go into a little more detail about when you described before there's like, you know, preparatory sessions and integrative sessions? Can you kind of like... Give us a little, walk us through that. Yeah. So the preparatory sessions, we are getting to know the participant, participants getting to know us. We're starting to talk about the trauma, but we, again, we tell people like that you are guiding this. We're not, you don't have to tell us anything in particular about your trauma right now. Do you You, already know their trauma history? We, yeah. So we, we know people's, what we call their index trauma, their main trauma. And, and we've done a, trauma assessment at intake. But, you know, as we're finding, surprise, surprise, as you go through the study, and, you know, I'm sure you see this in your work, Laura. I see this. Exactly what you're going to say. Yeah. People come in like, oh, you know, I'm having a nosebleed. Oh, wait, actually, I have, you know, bloody diarrhea. Or, you know, oh, the problem is my father. Oh, wait, it's not my father. You know, so we're finding the study, especially as the MDMA catalyzes these sort of self-compassionate deep dives into places of the psych you know the psyche where people have not been able to go that stuff's coming up that is shocking them and us i mean you're know, sitting through well actually let me back up so i'll get to the actual session so okay. the preparatory sessions are re, are, t- are to talk about what's going to happen on this on the medication versus placebo days but also to let people know like this is they're in really in charge like we're they are not performing for us they don't have to do anything they're not expected you know to talk about trauma a or b in a certain way that that we really try to model in the preparation sessions what's going to happen in the drug versus placebo sessions which is we're just going to let it unfold and we're going to be there to support them and whatever comes up but they you know, think people are worried, am I doing it right? Or what do I have to do? Or do I need to, you know, what do you guys want me to do to address my trauma? And, you know, at least the model in this study is, no, we're not, we're not telling you what to do. We might make suggestions, but uh, this is a, this is about you 
moving forward as you see fit. So there's definitely people I've worked with in the study that going into even the first experimental day, the MDMA versus placebo, I felt like I didn't have a very good sense of their trauma because they just were, it was too hot to touch. So we do three preparatory sessions, about 90 minutes, and then we do the all day MDMA or placebo sessions. So we we give people a dose of MDMA or placebo and it's double blind, meaning a therapist don't know, participant doesn't know. And we sit with them for eight and a half to nine hours, which I'm a very fidgety, squirmy person. <laughs> <laughs> and even my co-therapist and actually our whole team here, they all said, Craig, how are you going to do the experimental days? Like, <laughs> you're not very good at sitting still. So I do a lot of deep breathing and I meditate. <laughs> it's actually been good for me to just practice. Like, what is it like to sit with someone for that many hours? Yeah, you gotta, they got to put you on an exercise ball or something. I know something, but we, I, you know, one way, I, one way I've thought about the experimental days, it's kind of like deep sea fishing. Like we're out on this boat and we're way out at sea and we're just casting out lines and we're just waiting. And we just, cause you know, as soon as we give the placebo or MDMA to the participant, we encourage them to put on eye shades and we have some pre-prepared music soundtracks that's build in sort of intensity and, and change as we might expect the blood level of the MDMA to change. And oh. as people, yeah, so we have these very interestingly pre-planned um, soundtracks that we play for people. That, and the music is a really powerful part of driving it. Everyone says that, uh, even on placebo, that the music, you know, because how many people for hours would just lay on a sofa with eye shades and music and with the instructions, just go inside, go in, go inside and see what you find. Cause that's, that, that's where we're telling people. Um, Definitely sounds like what people did in the seventies, what they put on the ear earphones, the album, like dark side of the moon, yeah. and the LSD. And they're just like going with it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but it's funny you mentioned that Laura. One of the things that, that maps has urged us, which it makes a lot of sense now. I didn't get it at first is, we don't choose music that has recognizable words oh, good. because we don't, we don't want people getting pulled back and like, Oh, it's Madonna or yeah. Oh, it's dark side of the moon. I remember so, when I first heard this. Yeah, song. yeah. Right. It could just pull people out of their inner work. So the music, yeah. if it has words, it, it would be words in another language. Okay. Um, and then, um, and then, yeah, we're deep sea fishing and we're waiting and we're watching and we're waiting. And I mean, sometimes we're waiting for a couple hours and, and then sometimes people are, are tearing off their eye shades and taking off their headphones and it just comes forth of go, people going back into traumas from like from the overhead drone view. They're going back in their body. They're watching it. They're having family members come back and whisper in their ear and tell them it's going to be okay. They're replaying their traumas in all these different ways. Yet it's it's almost like as they replay their traumas, like this wave of self-compassion goes over them. And, you know, that we don't know what that is neurochemically. Is that oxytocin? Um, I mean, we know that that MDMA greatly cranks up self-compassion and trust and it turns fear essentially off. But so people, yeah, so the participants come out with this stuff and it, yeah, it's, I, I remember th telling my co-therapist, like, we're deep sea fishing. We don't know what we're going to pull up. And each all day session is so different. And part of that's participant driven. Part of that is, I'm guessing, you know, MDMA versus placebo or even where they are in their trauma therapy. And I mean, there have been times where I went into all day session two or three and such profound things that happened in all day one or two. I thought, what, what else could happen? Like we, we've just seen the most beautiful things, most powerful things. And then day three, even more comes up stuff again, that maybe the participant didn't ever want to revisit or didn't even know was there. Um, so like pre-verbal stuff? No, like what's a good example? So we've had people, for example, remember vividly remember conversations with family members or remember details of what happened when they were speaking to the police after the trauma or, and again, what's so, so interesting when you think about the nature of memory, like, are they actually remembering things the way it happened or is somehow the MDMA and this sort of burst of self-compassion, is it MDMA helping them rewrite a narrative which is kind and kinder and more forgiving and not shame-based. And, you know, we'll never know.
Let's just pause for a moment so I can give you a little bit more information about why I love therapy notes. I switched to therapy notes a few years ago. I'd say it's about three years now, I believe. And I have never regretted it. I was very happy with the EHR I used before, but therapy notes is more intuitive. I love the interface. The customer service is fantastic. And I love how I can get my notes done quickly because I can customize the template that I use for my notes and there are opportunities to put check marks rather than having to write out the intervention used. So I have cut my time spent writing notes way down, which is wonderful because I like to focus on seeing clients. I know documentation is an important part of our work, but it can also be time consuming. And that is why I love using therapy notes. If you are considering switching EHRs or you're looking for one to use in your practice, give therapy notes a try. You can get two free months by using the code therapy chat. Now let's get back to our interview. Or maybe that it just has, it's, there's more perspective, you know, like a big picture perspective instead of this, like, you know, and then this happened and it was because I'm bad. And you know, that sort of like, I guess, ego centric view that you would have when you're a child and the meaning you make out of your experiences. Yeah, because one, yeah, I've just had this image as you were speaking, Laura, of thinking like the way now when we try to access trauma with the, in ourselves or with other people, it's like, almost like there's little like points of fla- of light going back where we're trying to illuminate what happened, but we just have these little pinpricks of light. And MDMA therapy seems to be like a a huge burst of compassionate light that just lights it up, like almost mm. those flares, like that just you know you can shoot the flare and it lights up the dark street or and and but it lights it up with this this just peaceful it's okay it's 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 love i mean um on my um podcast i did a two part episode on healing psychedelic or sorry healing trauma with psychedelics and the guy I interviewed he talked about how the first time he ever felt love growing up in a family of great neglect and what was when his first mdma session he didn't even know what it was he felt this overwhelming feeling of just warmth and compassion it was love and he asked his the mdma therapist he said is this love i don't i think this might be love i've never felt this wow and so and that's that's the kind of things that we're seeing that's just i mean i mean i cry all the time i it's like everything makes me cry but i, cry. I like that you yeah. allow yourself to be moved I I moved a lot, but I oh so many tears in those sessions. In fact, when I, when I was just saying that about the music, uh, it, there was a time, um, one session we did right near the end, and we were hearing it so that the participant has headphones on, but we also pipe the music into the office so we can hear it, which is really awesome. Mm-hmm. And so maybe an hour, four and a half, after some profound work, Beatles, Here Comes the Sun came on. Oh. And it was so beautiful. Yeah. I mean, we 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 all three started singing along with it. Mm-hmm. And we just sang and we sang along with it and just out of just joy and relief and all the work that had happened over those past few hours. And and I said to my co-therapist, I said, How did you know to put that song right here? You know, because we're not supposed to have songs with words that we recognize. She said, I don't know. I just thought maybe by hour five we would want a good song we could sing to. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect. It was such a bonding moment of a singing. Here comes the sun. Mm, I can imagine. And, and I'm just so curious as I'm, I'm picturing this, as you're talking about it and the client is there and they've got the shades over their eyes and the earphones, and they're listening to music and they're inward. And then how is the interaction between the client and the well they're not a client they're a participant participant yeah and the the two co-therapists happening like is are they saying and then this happened and the co-therapists are like you know doing therapy with them or is it just sort of like holding space or what's going on with that yeah i think i'm sure it varies therapy team to therapy team and that's one of the reasons that that maps videotapes the teams and watches the videos to try to make sure that the teams are all doing in general sort of 
supportive but non-directive therapy. But there's definitely interpretations. I mean, that people, one of my participants in the study, he um, he didn't know about grooming. And so he described basically how he'd been groomed by a perpetrator. And I said, that's a thing. That's grooming. And But it, it was interesting, I think, to hear it while he was in such a heart-opened state it just sunk in like it brought tears to his eyes and my eyes to to realize that this was a whole process you know that mm-hmm. he was a, he was a sheep in the meadow and the, the wolf had a plan i mean and the wolf was had spent a lot of time making sure that that sheep was alone in the meadow like it, it was not random it was it was very carefully orchestrated um and then, you know, sometimes touch is part of it. And that, that's a very tricky thing. And, you know, so we spend a lot of time talking to people about touch. And we'll offer them a menu. Like in the prep sessions, like Kiwi, would say, you know, you could, we could uh, hold your hand. We could sit with you, you know, if you, uh, if you wanted to um, push on us. If you, if you needed to feel like you needed to fight, you could, you know, you could put your fists against our hands and push against us. We could do different kinds of body work. And most people, my ex- experience so far has been, you know, they think, yuck, I never, ever want you to touch me. I'm not so comfortable with that either, psychiatrist. Yeah, you know, especially when you work with abuse survivors, there's a pretty strong message, don't touch. Yeah. You know, although I've personally begun to be a little less rigid about if we want to give a high five or, (laughs) you know, the person asks to give a hug on the way out or something. Yeah. But my co-therapist has a lot of experience with somatic work. It's Mm -hmm. very comfortable with it. She just exudes, she's just, she radiates just like warmth and kindness. And yeah, she's just perfect. She's so safe. Like, yeah, she, yeah, she's the kind of person that you want her to be your mom. (laughs) So, so she, she is always, at least in our therapy diets and our sessions, she has been the one who in general has reminded people, you know, and experimental day one or two hey is is you know is there any kind of touch that might be helpful and i've seen some really powerful things happen with touch where you know it it could be holding hands you know times that yeah she she and i have sat next to the person when they were going through some hard stuff or even uh one guy said yeah i want to fight i want to fight i want to fight him off and so we um we held up our hands and he pushed against our fists and and we hit a very powerful energetic release as we sort of reenacted the 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 fighting and again i think it, that may sound very strange to people imagining it happening in your office right now it's not anything in a million years i would ever do in my general psychiatric practice but well we totally but, would do that when sensory motor psychotherapy or somatic yeah. experiencing which is i'm trained in sensory motor yeah no i'm i'm no, I'm, i just i mean i personally like i'm just not yeah i mean i'll touch people like during a neurological exam or anything, but but to see the power of it and again to have a female co-therapist there which makes it so much safer i think for a lot of people um and to see the power of the somatic work, because you know, you know, we know that trauma is held in the body, and a lot of people need. I think that the body has to be included in trauma therapy, and and MDMA has a very powerful somatic component as well. It's I don't know what is doing in the body, but it's doing something very powerful. And again, I think when you combine that with the the trust aspect and the self compassion aspect and the dialing down fear. It allows people to be in their bodies in a way they haven't been able to. It allows people to kind of break out of the dissociative freeze, to just connect to themselves. And if you, if you think about what's happening with the eye shades and the music, I mean, probably at, at the most basic level, people are connecting with themselves, which is not something they really have ever wanted to do or been able to do since the tr- you know, trauma occurred. Right, because the body is where the sensations and emotions related to the trauma are held. So if you can't tolerate experiencing them, then you have to be disconnected from your body. Mm-hmm. And that's definitely, I mean, it sounds it sounds like a really beautifully hopeful thing. But I just, before, I want to ask you about kind of what what do you feel is the you know, what are you seeing as the outcomes and what do you feel is the the promise of this? But before getting into that, I'd like to understand, because I'm imagining that it's all like 
blissful. And then I'm also knowing that, you know, if, if someone's saying I want to fight them off, Mm -hmm. you're saying fears turned off so maybe that's just neutral it's not this is happening and i'm i want to feel more empowered no there's still there can be strong emotions and we we've sat with people as they screamed the perpetrator's name sobbed rocked back and forth and you know in great pain again for people that only know mdma in sort of the rave uh party context it might be hard to imagine that people could actually be going through some really strong negative motions, but oh yeah, we see that for sure. And it then almost the other wouldn't make sense that it could be processing if there were no, no yeah. and it just doesn't seem possible, but oh, yeah. who knows? <laughs> no, no, it's very, even though it's beautiful, it's, it's not, um, oh yeah, it's not like it's sunshine and roses and people are smiling like, oh, it's all good. And my okay. trauma's gone. Oh no, 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 no. It's, and then what, you know, we see, and Laura, you and I talked a little bit about this before we started recording, is what we're seeing is even when the MDMA-assisted therapy is is really helpful and successful, that's just the beginning. I mean, that is just now people are seeing, okay, I want to maybe possibly connect with people or I could or I think I could trust or I I think I could do this life. And that's a whole other shock. And so that's... One of the reasons that people in the study, everyone who leaves the study, we absolutely make sure they can usually return to their referring trauma therapist, or if not, at least to some trauma therapist, because we're seeing in the study what we or what's been called the therapeutic bends, like the bends as in scuba diving bends. So the bends in scuba diving is when you come up too fast and you get crippling pain and potentially die from carbon dioxide coming out in your bloodstream, and. We're definitely seeing, I mean, I see that in the ketamine work I do, but in the in study, we're seeing that the people, some people are having such vast improvement, but then they come up so fast from their years of just miserable, com- complex, dissociated PTSD, and they look around and they realize, oh no, <laughs> now what? I I married my spouse in a time when I was so sick, and now I'm feeling better, but we're still in that old dynamic, or... Or they're um, still very sick. And they're, they're not, yeah. 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 So by no means is MAPS or any, any of us working on this. Or we're not thinking like, oh, this is some magic pill that you're going to go to Walgreens and take MDMA and your trauma's healed. Woo. No, I mean, that's – no, no, no. This is – we're really – I think the way to think about MDMA work and – and I think a lot of this psychedelic work that's – it's being that's happening now is that it's a catalyst. It's a way to speed things up. You know, it's it's a way to because you know some people are able and willing, emotionally, financially, time wise, to do the hard work of trauma therapy. A lot of people are not. They just they don't have the wherewithal to to put in the time and money and energy, or it's, or their trauma is just too awful. I mean, sometimes I think of complex PTSD. Like It's like we're asking a woman to birth a 14-pound baby, you know? It's just, it's not coming out. I mean, there's just not, it's just not going to happen. And, you know, M- MDMA is like a, that's like a compassionate epidural to help, help the trauma baby come out. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, none, none of us are claiming this is some miracle cure. I think we're, we're hoping that this will be, you know, a really powerful addition to the, you know, the options for treating one of the most intractable, miserable, and common things we see, which is complex PTSD and chronic PTSD. Because boy, I know at least as a psychiatrist, you know, what do we have to offer people with severe PTSD? Not much. Uh, I mean, ketamine can dial down depressive and suicidal symptoms associated with PTSD, and we can use beta blockers, and Prazosin for nightmares. I mean, it's definitely things we can do. And of course, there's all sorts of both talk and somatic and therapies and EMDR. There's a lot of things, ways to treat trauma, but still, I think we see in our work that it's a long, hard haul for most people. Mm-hmm. One of the episodes in my podcast, I, I, I did a two-part on EMDR. And the part two is a woman who did six years of EMDR to work on her complex PTC. And it, she got much, much, much better, but it was brutal slog. And she describes in the episode what that was like, the six years of working with a really incredible trauma therapist here in Fort Collins. And, you know, it works, but man, it was, it wasn't a marathon. It was an ultra marathon. It was an ultra marathon 
you know, in in the desert. I mean, it was just yeah. so hard. It was a hero's journey, but not everybody can do that. Well, you're not everyone's like resourced enough internally or externally to be able to do that where, you mm-hmm. know, for example, if you live in poverty and live in a violent community, you may not be able to, first of all, give six years <laughs> to mm-hmm. that work and deal with the aftermath of each session of how difficult it is and be able to take time off of work and things like that. You may not have paid time to off. So I can see how there could definitely be some barriers based on how, you know, stable, safe and supported your life is outside of the therapy sessions. Mm-hmm. But it seems like this could be a very promising way to kind of open a door to being able to safely access the painful material and do the work. Yeah, allow you, know. you to at least have a chance to do the work. That's a good to walk into the burning building of your trauma and and just have a chance to yeah, to try to put the fire out. Um, you used an analogy before. You said it it's like you're walking into a when you and I were talking, you said it's yeah. like you're walking into the burning building, but you have a fireproof suit. Yeah, yeah I think there's, like that. <laughs> yeah, that you know, if 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 your trauma is this burning building, and you know, your trauma therapist, other people saying, "Hey, let, like, let's let's go in there. I'll be with you. We can do this." And you just it's burning at ten thousand degrees, and you think, "I cannot go in there." And yeah, one way to think of MDMA, it, it seems to allow people yeah to to envelop them in a kind of protective suit that lets them walk in right into the trauma and do that, do that work. So yeah, the, the MDMA is not fixing the trauma or it's not some, you know, cure in a pill, but it, by its powerful effects on self-compassion and uh, empathy and, all right, let me back up. Actually, ecstasy, I don't know how many listeners know this, but ecstasy, the street drug. And so MDMA, when it was starting to be sold um, in bars in, in the early 80s in Texas and sold as a party drug, it was originally going to be called empathy. But then the guys making it decided that even though empathy was a much better, more accurate description of its effects, they thought they called it ecstasy because that would sell better. Mm. And so, but many people with experience with MDMA would say, oh yeah, empathy would have been a much more accurate description, but yeah, probably wouldn't have sold as well in the in the Texas bars in the early eighties. <laughs> <laughs> I want empathy. <laughs> empathy. Could I have a Bud Light? And two empathy. No, th- <laughs> three empathy. <laughs> well, you know what you said about self compassion. I think that feels so powerful because, in my experience in working with people with complex trauma, it's it can be the hardest thing to allow any self-compassion you know to even try to access it it all just feels way too vulnerable and not safe and the you know the threat response system gets activated by the idea of it you know Mm -hmm. so if i think what what helps me understand where this fits potentially based on my own just sitting with people in the therapy room it's like it can take so long just to build up enough trust to even begin to go there. And, you know, like the three phase approach where safety and stability is the first phase of trauma therapy. That part can be four years, five years. And then once the, the safe relationship is there and, you know, it's so hard to build it because relationships haven't been saved in the past, But once the safe relationship is there, it creates a space where the person can trust that they might be able to start doing the deeper work and and have someone they can count on to help them if it gets really intolerable. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're saying that they can reach that point of being able to trust more quickly. But do you think that effect persists after the the treatment, like the trust part? I know you said the symptoms are in remission. I do. Yeah. It's, I, again, I don't know that we can really explain the why of it, but I think participants would say that it's such a powerful experience to be in a supportive container with 
again, male, female therapists, and again, you mentioned the mom, dad transference thing, which I think is a powerful part of it, um, to be in a container all day. So just that, but then when you stir an MDMA that is just opening their heart, it's for many of these people, they have not felt anything like that either ever or in a long, 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 long time. Um, and so, you know, maybe like almost like the going on, you know, a five day outward bound trip or two week Knowles trip or two week summer camp, you could leave and you think, okay, that was just opened my heart and I'm so connected to those people because it was just, it was a different experience and different context and it opened you up. I mean, I've had this experience with holotropic breath work where when I did the MDMA therapist training, um, bef- at one of the five-day trainings, we all did holotropic breath work, uh, all the therapists in this big room. And uh, it, it broke me, it cracked me open for days, maybe a week. And they, they said later, they said, oh yeah, that's what we wanted. We wanted, said ideally we would have given everybody MDMA on day one to sort of crack people open and, and help them form powerful bonds with their co-therapists and other people. But the holotropic breath work did the same thing. I mean, maybe it's something about altered states or I don't know, but we're seeing that in the study that the, the powerful sort of trust that can form in those treatment days and, and in the integration sessions afterward, that continues. And that that's in part- itself seems worth doing it, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, there's something I remember, uh, what was it? saying i forgot who said this but there was a saying back in the 80s something like don't don't marry anyone for it was like six or 12 months uh after you've done mdma with them uh, meaning then the idea oh. is that it's so <laughs> that was an that 80s saying i never yeah, that one. <laughs> I remember that saying like back in the 80s like yeah, yeah don't marry anyone for at least a year after you've done mdma with them because it does open your heart to people and it's such a connecting thing that i think other people even in a recreational context people have reported that they can really open up their hearts to other people and they're not even trying they're just maybe out dancing together but if you have if so it could be you, like a stranger and they're like yeah. oh, i love you i've never uh, the, loved anyone as much as this yeah exactly okay but again but imagine if you took that sort of power and opening the heart and dropping defenses and you bring it into the container all day container with male female therapists like we are here to help you and we're here to sit with you and we're here to just see what happens and you don't have to do anything for us you don't we're not expecting anything from you we're just here to witness and support you i mean that is powerful stuff it sounds very powerful yeah the trust seems to persist that's amazing and yeah the last thing i want to ask you even though i would like to ask you so many more things but just for time's sake is about you know how you do define remission for this. I think people who are listening are like, but wait, what is remission? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So MAPS uses two different PTSD scales. Um, and I don't know if I'm supposed to mention those. No, that's fine. You don't have yeah, to. I think, yeah, I think I'm not supposed to talk about the scales. Okay. So uh, remission means uh, having a score low enough on those scales that you no longer meet criteria for PTSD. So granted, that that what we're talking about is that people reached a certain number or below and stayed there. And so that's an imperfect measure. And PTSD is a syndromic diagnosis and it's not, it's not like acute myelitic uh, leukemia where you have it or you don't. I mean, PTSD is a, it's a gradation, but yeah, these, these are nationally used scales. And so that, that's what they're measuring it on. Okay. So people may still have, trauma symptoms, but they do not have enough symptomatology to meet the criteria for PTSD. Yeah. On these measuring scales. Yeah. Yeah. And what we're seeing clinically is people are saying my nightmares are gone. I, um, I can be sexually intimate again. I can walk down the street and not feel in danger, or I feel like there's hope for my future. You know, those I can sleep. Things. I can sleep. Yeah. That's a big one. I Cause sleep. that's such a huge one. I mean, Almost everyone yeah. with trauma, sleep is a major problem. Right. Yeah, when the smoke alarm of your sympathetic nervous system is going off all the time, yeah, how, how do you sleep? Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't, and then you have nightmares. Mm-hmm. 
Well, this has been, as I expected, a fascinating discussion. And I'm so grateful, Craig, that you wanted to share this with us today. Yeah, this has been really fun. We got to do it again soon. Yes, I would love to talk with you more because, you know, we didn't even, we barely scratched the surface of what you're doing with ketamine. And, you know, I know a lot of people are curious about that too. So maybe we can have a part two, but for now. Yeah, I would love that. Thank you. I would too. So where can people find you? And I will post what you're about to tell me in the show notes. So where where's your website that people can find everything you're okay. doing in your podcast? Yeah, my website is Craig Heacock, C-R-A-I-G-H-E-A-C-O-C-K-M-D, Craig Heacock, M-D dot com. Uh, and the podcast is called Back from the Abyss. And you can access it from my website or it's on all the podcast platforms. And just just know on the podcast, some of the episodes are very heavy. Some of them are lighter and a couple are even funny. But um, one of my friends said the other day that I should put like a hot chili warning on the episodes to warn people <laughs> how spicy they are. So episode one is a four chili spicy Whoa. episode. It's very intense, um, near and dear to my heart. I still cry every time I hear it. But yeah, so if you listen to one episode from Back from the Abyss and it feels like it's a little too too hot, you could find a less spicy one that might make you smile. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems like you're doing in many different ways, you're doing great things in the world. And I'm so glad for you that you are and, and for the world. So thanks again oh, for thank being you. my guest. Yeah, this has been so fun. We'll do it again soon. Thanks so much for listening to my interview with Dr. Craig Heacock. As you can hear, the progression of our conversation, I was much more open and curious about the use of MDMA with trauma survivors after talking with Craig. And honestly, I feel like it seems very promising. I hope so. I want there to be ways for people to get relief as much as possible. What did you think? I would love to know your thoughts about this. Are there any concerns or drawbacks that you might be aware of that we didn't get to or we haven't discussed? Have you ever had a client who has undergone any of the psychedelics for helping PTSD and did they have a positive experience, negative experience, neutral? I'm really curious. As always, I'd love to know what you think about this episode and you can go to the website therapychatpodcast.com and leave me a message on SpeakPipe. I might use your voice in a future episode if you decide to leave me a message. So until next time, thank you so much for listening to Therapy Chat. Today's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes. There are many ways to keep your practice organized, but Therapy Notes is the best. Their easy-to-use, secure platform lets you not only do your billing, scheduling, and progress notes, but also create a client portal to share documents and request signatures. Plus, they offer amazing unlimited phone support, so when you have a question, you can get help fast. To get started with the practice management software trusted by over 60,000 professionals, go to therapynotes.com and start a free trial today. If you enter promo code THERAPYCHAT, they will give you two months to try it out for free. Just another reminder that if you'd like to become a member of Therapy Chat, supporting the podcast while receiving fun member perks and being able to communicate with me one-on-one, go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. If every subscriber donated just $1 per month, Therapy Chat would be able to keep going strong indefinitely. Thanks so much for your support. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.